How did the Republican Party go from the party of emancipation to the party of avoiding urban areas? The long road to oblivion begins on the snowy night of March 20, 1854 in Ripon, Wisconsin, when a group of abolitionists led by Alvin Bovey met inside the little white schoolhouse and created the Republican Party. Six years later, this new Republican Party would elect its first president, Abraham Lincoln. After the Civil War, the Republican-controlled Congress forced the enactment of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery in the United States, the 14th Amendment granting citizenship to all former slaves, and the 15th Amendment giving African-American males the right to vote. And now that they could vote, Southern Democrats got really worried about African-Americans and Republicans running their governments. So in 1868, these same Democrats co-opted a little paramilitary organization called the Ku Klux Klan, whose members were wearing white hoods and sheets and ravaging the land threatening black elected officials, intimidating voters, and lynching black Republicans, white Republicans, or anyone else who wanted to help free the slaves. This all made the Republican Party the African American Party for the next 60 years. But after being hit hard by the Depression and feeling taken for granted, many black Republicans were open to Democratic presidential nominee Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932. He had to only promise a little, but it meant a lot. And once he was in office, his New Deal began the turn of African Americans from the Republican Party. Japanese dream of conquest However, after World War II, most black Democrats still only considered themselves Roosevelt Democrats. But three events would occur which would change American politics forever. In July 1948, President Harry S. Truman issued Executive Order 9981 integrating the racially segregated U.S. military and knocking down a major barrier to equality. A few months later, partly due to support from the African American community, President Truman was rewarded with an upset re-election win. I, Harry S. Truman, do solemnly swear. And for the first time, a majority of African Americans identify themselves as Democrats. Only 25% of African Americans would still identify themselves as Republican. This number would never be attained again. These two weeks would be more important than every bit of the campaign up to this point. But I want to tell you this. Whatever has happened up to this point, you haven't seen anything yet. Now it's just... Truer words were never spoken, because a few weeks before the 1960 presidential election, Republican candidate Richard Nixon and Democratic candidate John Fitzgerald Kennedy were in a tight race when Martin Luther King was arrested after his first sit-in protest and quickly sentenced to six months hard labor. Now King had voted for the Republican ticket in 1956, and even kept in touch with Nixon after a 1957 trip to Ghana. However, Nixon's political choice was clear support King and lose the white Southern vote, or ignore King and lose the black vote. Despite the pleas of his longtime friend and fellow Republican, Jackie Robinson, Nixon never picked up the phone to contact the King family, nor did he speak out or take any public action on King's behalf. Hearing nothing from Vice President Nixon, King's pregnant wife Coretta reached out to the Kennedy campaign. But Senator Kennedy didn't want to lose Southern white voters either, so he discreetly called Mrs. King, offering words of support. When news broke of Kennedy's call, Nixon again declined to call Mrs. King because he feared it would look like pandering. A few days later, Martin Luther King was released from Reedsville State Prison. Well, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Senator Kennedy and his family for this. Uh, I don't know the details of it, but naturally, I'm very happy to know of Senator Kennedy's concern and uh, all that he did to make this possible. Wasting no time, the Kennedy campaign printed over two million copies of a thin blue pamphlet, soon to be known as the Blue Bomb. Distributed outside black churches two days before the election, these pamphlets held endorsements and testimonials for Kennedy and galvanized the black vote. Because of one phone call and Nixon's silence, I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. Senator Kennedy won the tightest presidential election in U.S. history, and the Democratic Party gained entry into the hearts of Southern blacks for the first time. The final nail in the coffin came in 1964, where Republican presidential candidate Senator Barry Goldwater voted against the much needed 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
even though the act was supported by a greater percentage of Republicans than Democrats in Congress. Goldwater saw the Civil Rights Act as an infringement of states' rights. But around the country, many Republicans and almost all black Republicans didn't see it that way. And at the convention, the great baseball pioneer and Republican Jackie Robinson said, Anyone who came out openly for uh, Senator Goldwater as a presidential down any Negro, would have a most difficult time living among Negroes because people will not support anyone who expresses the kind of uh, Uncle Tomism that we feel would go with the support of a uh, Senator Goldwater. Needless to say, President Lyndon Baines Johnson won his re-election that year and he took almost all of black America with him. Four years later, in 1968, the year I was born, candidate Richard Nixon would perfect something called the Southern Strategy and finally win the White House. We haven't had a two-party system in urban America ever since.